preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is Richard Crystal. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the 92nd Street Y, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's lecture in our Living History series. The format for the lecture will be a speech then a question period, and there will be a book signing in the hallway behind the, behind the uh, art gallery. This is an art gallery. Uh, the topic for tonight is Khrushchev, the man and his era. And uh, for creating this opus, William Taubman earned the Pulitzer Prize last year in history. Uh, he's written and studied extensively in Russia and in Russian history. The book itself was the first full comprehensive biography of Khrushchev and the first biography of any Soviet leader to use the full range of sources that became available uh, after Glasnost. The uh, speaker this evening, William Taubman, is the Bertrand Snell Professor of Political Science at Amherst and the author of several other books on, Ru on Russia, Moscow Spring, which he wrote with his wife Jane, Stalin's American Policy, A View from Lenin Hills, and others. And as things would have it, he also happens to be my college roommate. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, I need to correct one thing that you may notice in the book. There's mention of the fact that this work, which is really a lifetime's work, took uh, 20 years to put together, in part because it was so hard to get information out of the Soviet Union. But uh, I recall from college, which was more than 20 years ago, that he had Khrushchev in his sights even then. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, to demonstrate that the Super Bowl does not occupy every corner of everyone's life. But I'd like to uh, present a peculiar request, perhaps. Our speaker tonight is an ardent Patriots fan. And the game is being TiVo'd at home. <laughs> so anybody who has any information about the Super Bowl, please keep it to yourself. <laughs> Bill Taubman. Good evening, football fans. Actually, Dick and I were indeed roommates in college, and he made himself a distinguished career as a New York City lawyer, and I went off to Amherst to be a college professor, and you can tell that from our outfits tonight. He's dressed like a college professor, and I, trying to live up to New York City, uh, am trying to pass as a New York City lawyer. One of the wonderful things about writing a book and getting to talk about it uh, after you do is you get to see old friends, and I see several out there tonight in the audience, and you get to make new ones. So it's a particular pleasure for me to be here where I think the first time <clears throat> I ever set foot in this building was approximately 1954 when my mother insisted I cross the park, we lived on the west side, to study social dancing. Um, it was one of the most painful uh, episodes in my entire life. Ineffective. And ineffective, says my wife, yes. <laughs> we, I won't tell you about uh, her dancing. Uh, now, before we, before we begin tonight, and actually in honor of, of, of the football, I want to begin with Khrushchev's shoe and the banging of it. But before we begin, I wanted to remind you uh, of what he looked like. Many of you probably remember very well, but I, I brought with me two videos from which I'd like to show excerpts. And let me introduce them very briefly. They're very different. One of them is from a kind of embarrassingly fawning and flattering Soviet film documentary film about Khrushchev made in 1962-63 when he was still in power. And I want to show you an excerpt from that, both so you can be reminded of what a fawning, flattering Soviet film is about a Soviet leader. You'll hear it not only in the pictures, but in the music and in the voice of the announcer. Uh, 
Um, but then you'll see some pictures of Khrushchev as a young man delivering a speech to the Supreme Soviet in the early 30s. And then the second uh, film uh, from which I'm going to show an equally brief two-minute excerpt is from the CNN film from their series on the Cold War. This was, their, this was a film about Sputnik, but I chose it because we'll see Khrushchev debating Nixon in Moscow in 1959, and then we'll see some scenes from um, Khrushchev's visit to the United States later that year. And here, I want to alert you to one mistake in the subtitled uh, translation at the bottom of the screen. Both films have subtitles at the bottom of the screen, but in this one, we will hear Nixon trying to impress Khrushchev and the audience, and he says, you'll have to forgive my uh, attempt at a Nixon imitation, but you'll hear Nixon say something like this to Khrushchev. He, they're standing together, and he says something like, uh, you, uh, you may be ahead of us in the thrust of your rockets, but uh, we are ahead of you when it comes to color television. Uh, and then you'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear Khrushchev saying, nyet, 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 nyet. And then what he says is translated on the screen as, nyet, nyet. No, we are ahead of you in that, meaning rockets, and we're, we, we will catch up with you, the translation says, in color television. Well, those of you who know Russian, if you listen very closely, you'll hear him say, we're already ahead of you in color television, too, <laughs> which, of course, uh, was a load. Okay, uh, somewhere there's a nice man who is ready to show us these two video clips. Would you show us the first one, please? В прошлом донецкий шахтер. Сегодня он руководитель первого в мире государства рабочих и крестьян. Человека труда присущий. Вот почему советские люди называют его наш Никита Сергеевич. Товарищи, разрешите мне выразить благодарность фабрикам, заводам и всем трудящимся, которые выставили мою коррентуру в Верховный Совет. И разрешите заверить вас, что я буду с честью выполнять обязанности члена Верховного Совета, если буду избран, и все силы отдам на укрепление нашей большевистской партии, на укрепление нашей великой Родины, нашего Советского Союза. Okay, let's, if you're turning it off. And put on the second one. We may briefly see an Sputnik era before the scene shifts to Moscow. In 1959, Vice President Richard Nixon opened the American National Exhibition in Moscow. He tried to impress Khrushchev with America's advances in color television. There are some instances where you may be ahead of us. For example, in the development of your of the thrust of your rockets for the investigation of outer space. There may be some instances, for example, color television, where we're ahead of you. But in order for both of us to, for both of us to benefit, for both of us to benefit, you see, you never concede anything. Where do, where do, where do you see the picture? I feel, I feel sure. Khrushchev toured the United States, the first communist leader to be invited. In Hollywood, the stars turned out to entertain him. In the streets, people gave him a frostier welcome. The last few days of the visit he spent with Eisenhower at Camp David. Both said they were ready to slow down the arms race. 
It was difficult for Eisenhower to argue for restraint. The American people were convinced that the missile gap favored Russia. Okay. Thank you. You can turn the second one off. By this time, you may wish that the tapes actually would continue, but I'm going to tell you a bit about Khrushchev's shoe. Um, that shoe is one of the most uh, iconic moments in history, the shoe that he allegedly banged at the United Nations. I say allegedly because one of the things I learned, not so much in writing the book, but afterwards, was that the shoe may never have been banged, and I think you ought to know about that. Um, it was supposed to have been banged at the United Nations in the fall of 1960. This was Khrushchev's second trip to New York, second trip to the United States. He had come for the first time in the fall of 1959, and he uh, had toured from coast to coast, New York, Washington, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Pittsburgh, all the way across the country. It was a, a triumphant tour with the single exception that he wasn't welcomed, in fact, wasn't allowed at all to visit Disneyland, of which he made a big uh, to-do. But compared to that first trip, the second trip was a disaster. It had followed, you may recall, a shoot-down. The Americans had sent the U-2 flight, spy flight, over Russia in, on May Day of all dates, high Soviet holiday in 1960. The Soviets had shot it down, and as a result, the summit conference that Khrushchev was to attend in Paris on May 16th, along with Eisenhower and Macmillan and de Gaulle, was also destroyed. So when he came to the United States the second time in the fall of 1960, he was mighty angry at Eisenhower. And it turns out, I learned this from Khrushchev's uh, foreign policy advisor at that time, that one of the reasons he came and stayed at great length, even after some of the other leaders in the world had gone home, was to get his revenge on the man he now regarded as the Prince of Darkness, namely Ike, in Ike's own court. Well, he stayed for three weeks, and at one point when he was particularly irritated, he supposedly banged that shoe, or did he? Well, I always thought he did, and if you read my book, you'll find I use the word bang the shoe. But if you look closely at footnote number one, the first footnote in the book, you will find there reported what I learned at the very last minute when it was too late to change some of the text. I interviewed a man, a New York Times correspondent living in New Jersey at the time in a rest home who had been saying for 30 years that Khrushchev did not bang the shoe at the United Nations. In fact, as he put it to me, he said, I saw Khrushchev not bang the iconic shoe. Well, that's why I added that footnote, and I left it at that when the book came out. But after the book was published and I started making some appearances, giving some talks, that's when the evidence came pouring in, which I want to report to you tonight. I gave a talk at the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars in Washington, and the room was filled with veterans of the Khrushchev era from the American government. And after I spoke, one man got up and said, uh, I was there, and he did not bang his shoe. I can confirm this, Professor Taubman. Whereupon another man got up and said, I'm sorry, I was there, and he did bang his shoe. A third man got up and said, as a matter of fact, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I was there. I was five feet behind him at the time, and he had the shoe in his hand, and he pounded the table with his hand, but the shoe in his hand never touched the table. <laughs> well, I thought that might be the end of the story, but I began to get communications from a wider world, and I hold in my hand uh, a letter I got from a man who in 1960 had been a Life Magazine correspondent. Later he became uh, Life Magazine's photography editor. And here's what he says. He says, the right-hand wall, as you face the speaker in the General Assembly, held a booth for still photographers. All seven or so New York City daily papers and three or more wire services were there, as well as freelance photographers from picture agencies and me from Life Magazine. I can assure you that every camera in our booth was trained on Khrushchev, waiting for him to use the shoe. He only put it on again and left. None of us missed the, missed the picture, which would have been a serious professional error. The event never occurred. I then got another letter from a uh, Ukrainian uh, woman emigre living in New York. Uh, 
who remembered seeing him bang the shoe on television. And I now quote this letter. As I recall, my husband was getting ready to go to work, happened to see it as he was walking past the TV set, told me to run quickly to watch, and we stood there transfixed. We happened to have a house guest at the time. This is beginning to read like a Woody Allen uh, movie scenario. My cousin Sonia, who was here from the Soviet Union on a visit. She was taking a shower at the time. When she came out, we told her what had happened, but she didn't believe us. Eventually, other relatives who had been watching told her that they had seen it too, so she finally conceded he must have banged his shoe. The next uh, communication that I hold in my hand, I received as an email from France from a man named Charles Boucher, and he says, I recall very vividly seeing and hearing the event on at least one occasion in a TV documentary here in France. Very clearly you can see Khrushchev holding a dark object in his right hand and banging the desk with it in front of him. Was it his shoe? It was a dark object, which could have been the size of a shoe. And then he informs me of a theory which has been circulating in France for some years and uh, which he would like me to be aware which is yet a different version of the question of whether he banged the shoe. I quote again, the theory goes that Khrushchev had a third shoe brought in for this purpose, <laughs> a premeditated rhetorical trick consistent with his image as the tough peasant leader of the socialist bloc with no patience for his bourgeois opponent's slick lies. Well, I have one more uh, communique to convey. I was so taken with this question of whether Khrushchev did um, bang the shoe or not that I wrote an op-ed page piece that appeared in the uh, Herald Tribune in Paris and um, a Russian emigre, a Russian medieval historian, an old friend of mine, encountered this story and he then sent me the following uh, brief, very brief consideration of the transcendent epistemological question at issue in the shoe incident, which is to say, uh, how do we know exactly what happened? Or can we tell or find out the truth of exactly what happened even in an iconic instance like this? And here's what this Russian medieval historian has to say. If one cannot establish the truth in an event with hundreds of eyewitnesses, many of whom are alive and talking, What's the point of reconstructing events centuries old? <laughs> you will be happy to hear that the shoe, however interesting, is not the centerpiece of my remarks tonight. Uh, because Mr. Khrushchev, Comrade Khrushchev, was one of the most important leaders, political leaders of the 20th century, and also, also extraordinarily interesting, contradictory, colorful, impulsive, explosive, just plain funny at times, as well as bloody. Let me just give you some highlights from his career in the form of a series of contradictions. This is a man who rose from the most humble of beginnings in a poor peasant village to become a member of Stalin's inner circle in the Kremlin. This is a man who was Stalin's accomplice in terrible crimes, but who later attempted to de-Stalinize Russia. This is a man who attempted to ease the Cold War, if not end it, and instead produced or helped to produce two of its most dangerous crises, the Berlin crisis and the Cuban crisis. This is a man who gave communism or tried to give communism a human face, initially his own interesting face, but instead began a process that culminated 35 years later in the collapse of communism itself. And long before that, it culminated in his own ouster, ignominious, unexpected, sudden, in 1964. The even larger significance of Khrushchev is that this is a man who set the stage for Gorbachev and Yeltsin. I found this out when I had a chance to inter interview Gorbachev at one point while working on this book. And Gorbachev described himself as a child of the 20th Party Congress. The 20th Party Congress was the occasion in 1956 at which Khrushchev gave the famous secret speech denouncing Stalin. And finally, by way of why I think this man is so important and that so much can be learned from his life, his life and his career hold up a kind of mirror to 
two-thirds of the Soviet age as a whole. He was born in 1894, and he lived through revolution, civil war, collectivization of agriculture, industrialization of the country, the Great Terror, World War One, World War II, sorry, the Cold War, Stalinism, post-Stalinism. And in his life, one can see reflected all of these things, all in the life of one man. One man who, by his own admission, was up to his elbows in blood, and yet who tried to make amends, not only by denouncing Stalin, but by releasing and rehabilitating millions of people from Stalin's labor camps, giving them back, if not their lives. It was too late for that in many cases, but at least their good names. In this sense, his story raises an even broader question yet, broader, that is, than Soviet Russia's history itself, because that question has to do with what led a man who, in my view, was initially early in life a decent man, what led a man who was initially a decent man to end up assisting Stalin in mass murder on an almost unprecedented scale, and how did that same man, after being corrupted by ambition and power and misplaced idealism, how did he retain enough of that initial decency to try to make amends and to do good. As you can see, we are talking about a person, a story, I should say, that takes place at what you might call the crossroads of history and personality. It's a story about the huge difference that a larger-than-life person and personality can make in history. Having said that, I immediately want to enter a couple of caveats. Of course, much that happens in Khrushchev's life, much that happens as part of his story, is not personal, but rather reflects the huge, powerful, impersonal forces that are shaping the history that I'm interested in this evening. Stalin's legacy, for example, captures Khrushchev even as he struggles against it. It shapes the society that he's trying to change. It thwarts his efforts, ultimately, uh, to reform that society and ends up uh, leading in part to his ouster. So that's one example of a larger impersonal force. The second thing I have in mind, I want to describe to you in his own colorful words. This has to do with the intractability, the unchangeability, the difficult to reform Russia itself. And in this passage that I'm going to read to you from my book, Khrushchev uh, is ruminating about this to none other than Fidel Castro. Castro had come to visit the Soviet Union in 1963, and he and Nikita spent a month traveling around the country together, and they spent a lot of time up in a place north of Moscow that we once visited called Zavidovo, which is a kind of resort. Uh, and they, sh they were shooting uh, ducks and pheasants and sitting around and talking. And one reason Khrushchev was so determined to spend so much time talking to Castro was that Castro was very upset with Khrushchev's handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but I'll tell you more about that later. Anyway, they're sitting up in Zvidovo, and Khrushchev says to Castro, you'd think I, as first secretary of the Communist Party of Russia, Soviet Union, could change anything in this country. Like hell I can. No matter what changes I propose and carry out, everything stays the same. Russia's like a tub full of dough. You put your hand in it down to the bottom, and you think you're the master of the situation. When you first pull out your hand, a little hole remains. But then, before your very eyes, the dough expands into a spongy, puffy mass. That's what Russia is like. And uh, I won't say Russia is exactly like that, but Khrushchev was, of course, only one of a series of historical reformers who tried to change Russia and who succeeded only in part. And then there is the outside world, which he tried to get along with better than his terrible predecessor, Stalin, when he tried to ease, if not end, the Cold War. But that world wouldn't play his game, not the United States, not China, not even Marshal Tito in a smaller country like Yugoslavia. And so 
forces like that also contributed to shaping the outcome of his era and the outcome of his own career. What I'd like to do at this point is to give you a very short summary of some of the main developments in his life that I think are crucial for understanding him and his personality and the impact of that personality on his policies, on his politics, on his career, and on his country and the world. I go back to that native village of Kalinovka in southern Russia, which I mentioned. I had the good fortune to be able to visit it, taken there by Khrushchev's son, Sergei Khrushchev, who now lives in Cranston, Rhode Island, much to the chagrin of many of his Russian compatriots who think it was a kind of betrayal of a former leader of theirs to become an American citizen. But Sergei and his wife took me to Kalinovka, uh, and I could see what a poor village it once was, although it no longer is as much because it was Khrushchev's village, so they worked on it in his time. But the point is not only that it was poor and that he was poor, but that he had only two or maybe three years of formal education in a village school. Two or three years of primitive educa education in a primitive village school. Uh, to be sure, he twice returned later in life for what passed as adult education, once in his 20s and once in his 30s. But both times he was distracted by politics, becoming a kind of big man on campus. Uh, I had the f good fortune also to find his English teacher uh, from the early 30s when he was a student at the Industrial Academy in Moscow. I found her too in a rest home outside of Moscow. I spent a lot of my time, as you can see, working on this book in rest homes. Uh, and she told me that he was a smart guy, very smart, very winning, charming, but a terrible student of English because he was always to be found in the hallway yakking it up with his friends rather than in class where he should have been. So this is a man uh, of absolutely primitive cultural background, but hugely ambitious, encouraged, I believe, by an idolizing mother uh, and a worshipful teacher in one of those schools in his village. I think also to some extent shaped by the image of his father as a kind of ne'er-do-well, but I won't go further into that. At any rate, hugely ambitious, shrewd, intelligent, and yet primitive and crude. And here, uh, at the risk, actually I've already checked with the authorities at the Y to make sure that this quote from Khrushchev won't trespass on the rules of the house. But what I want to read is something that Khrushchev once said in a kind of explosion at a Soviet sculptor, Ernst Niesviesny, who later uh, designed actually the monument at Khrushchev's grave at Novodevichy Cemetery in Moscow. Niesviesny is a distinguished artist who I think lives in New York. He did some years ago when I went out there to interview him. Khrushchev was, was angry at him, as you can hear from what I'm about to read. Says Khrushchev to Niesviesny, your art resembles this. It's as if a man climbed into a toilet, slid down under the seat, and from there, from under the toilet seat, looked up at what was above him, at someone sitting on the seat, looking up at that particular part of the body from below, from under the seat. That's what your art is like. That's your position, comrade Niesviesny. You're sitting in the toilet. Well, um, you may well ask, how could somebody this crude, this ill-educated, -edu this primitive, rise as high and as far as Khrushchev did? And I think the answer, somewhat predictable, some of it is predictable, has to do with things like working very hard, believing in his master, Joseph Stalin, believing in the cause of communism that was allegedly being built in the Soviet Union, um, but I think it also has to do with, play, with Khrushchev's remarkable ability to play on his very primitive image, to make the most of his apparent lacks and fallbacks and drawbacks, to play the part of a kind of simple peasant, or as I've thought of it at times, to play the part of a kind of court jester in Stalin's court. Now, how do I know he did this? partly from things that other people had to say about him, partly from the way he describes his own behavior, but also from some close watching that I did of 
documentary film footage of Khrushchev. I spent a couple of days at the Soviet film archives outside of Moscow, a place called Krasnogorsk, in the company of a Soviet uh, documentary film director, and we looked for two days at documentary footage, particularly of, Stal of Khrushchev interacting with Stalin. And we looked at it in, sometimes in slow motion, and a couple of times we looked at it frame by frame. It was almost all silent footage, so I cannot prove to you that the, in the couple of scenes that I describe, uh, he was actually telling Stalin jokes. But I would bet an awful lot on it, because in one, for example, Stalin is standing on the famous Lenin, later to be Lenin Stalin mausoleum at Red Square, watching as the, as the faithful parade by on May 1st, and Stalin has this grim visage, uh, which he was famous for, and suddenly, hopping up from behind is this cheerful Khrushchev, looking the way he did in that first video, with a white hat cap on and a face wreathed in an ingratiating smile. And he must be telling Stalin a joke. He just must be telling Stalin a joke, because he's grinning, and he's talking, and he's talking, and Stalin never breaks, us, never breaks us into a smile. So I'm convinced that, Stalin, that Khrushchev played the role of a court jester in Stalin's court, and that's why that chapter I actually uh, title Stalin's Pet. The actual Russian, for those of you who may know Russian in the audience, was Lubimchik. Lubimchik, which means little favorite. And Khrushchev says that I was known as Stalin's Lubimchik, which I translated as Stalin's Pet. I think a further element of this story is that this very role which Khrushchev pet played to perfection and which had such a successful outcome, so namely surviving Stalin and eventually beating Stalin's, beating his rivals to succeed Stalin, rivals who underestimated Stalin, uh, Khrushchev that is, I think that playing this role so brilliantly cost him psychologically. I think in his own way he was mortified to have to play up the very qualities of his character which he would have wished to play down. That he was not, he wanted, he knew he was an earthy man, he knew he had a sense of humor, he liked to appear as a man of the people, but I think, I know, I, I, I think that he wanted to be more educated and cultivated than he actually was. And my evidence for this is that he went to the opera, he went to the theater, he went to the ballet, he read, he had people read to him. He tried to make of himself more than he was culturally. Uh, and so to play the fool uh, was mortifying. Mortifying because it, to an extent, Khrushchev actually was the fool. And in fact, that's why he played the fool so brilliantly. Anyway, he reached the top. He reached the top, he became the leader of a vast transcontinental empire which he was ill-equipped to govern. Because as Soviet leader, he was in charge of everything from foreign policy to poetry. Soviet leaders felt it incumbent upon themselves to tell bricklayers how to lay bricks, poets how to write poetry, ballerinas how to dance, and everything else. Khrushchev wasn't equipped to do it, and that was one of the reasons why troubles began to crowd in upon him. That and the fact that, as I said earlier, changing this society in the way he tried to change it was just very difficult, if not impossible, to do. Anyway, his reaction to the troubles that crowded in on him was to try to stop the process, to reverse it, to find his way out, to change the situation by big, huge gambles that he took, risks that he took. He was a kind of gambler by nature as well. But as we all know, taking a series of big risks means that you're going to fail as much as you succeed and probably a lot more often, and he did. That deepened his troubles, deepened his predicament. His way of coping with that was to lash out again, trying to resolve the situation, but again, he found himself in more and more trouble. And I'm going to give you some examples now as I turn to focus on three or four major episodes in which his behavior affected his world and ours, and if we hadn't been lucky, might not have simply affected our world, but conceivably ended it. I have in mind, first of all, the Berlin crisis. You may remember, some of you, others may know, that in 1958, Khrushchev uh, issued an ultimatum. 
which said that within six months, the Western powers, the United States, France, and England, did not turn control over access to West Berlin, which had been in four power hands, to East Germany. Uh, or, I'm sorry, it did not sign a peace treaty agreeing on peace with Germany, including East Germany, then he would turn control over access to Berlin to the East Germans, which would violate the sacred Potsdam Accords of the end of World War II. Needless to say, Eisenhower, Macmillan, and de Gaulle refused to accept and obey this ultimatum. They made plans for troops uh, prepared the way to send Western troops down the Autobahn from West Germany to West Berlin, which, if you remember, was deep inside East Germany. And if the Soviets had resisted, they, we would have fought them. And if we had fought them, God knows what would have happened. Fortunately, it never happened. But when I look back at this crisis, I was shocked to discover that Khrushchev never was entirely clear in his mind about any particular aspect of it. He was not entirely clear about precisely what he wanted to be the conclusion of the crisis. He did not know exactly he was, how he was going to go about achieving whatever his goals were. He misunderstood the obstacles in his way in the form of West German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer French President de Gaulle, Eisenhower, and Macmillan. He knew them all, he'd met them all, but I don't think he understood the extent to which they were going to be prepared to resist him. And it turns out he had no fallback plan to fall back on when they resisted him. Fortunately, however, a way was found out of it, which I describe in my book, thanks partly to the fact that Khrushchev was not going to press it too far and the Western powers agreed to start talking to him, and he was willing to talk rather than to push this crisis to its final conclusion. But along the way, some remarkably uh, entertaining things happened, as well as some scary events. And I'd like to uh, tell you about two encounters that Khrushchev had with Americans, which I think fit my description of, uh, of entertaining, although I'm not sure that the people involved found it that entertaining. One of them was Senator Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota, later Vice President of the United States under Johnson. And in December 1958, Humphrey, who was still a senator, went to Moscow to try to find out, among other things, why Khrushchev had announced this ultimatum on Berlin and what he was going to do about it. Well, Humphrey made clear that he would like a meeting with Khrushchev. Uh, he didn't get an answer for the first few days he was there. Finally, suddenly, he got a summons to the Kremlin. He was told on an hour's notice, after having you know, let them know months in advance that this is what he wanted, on an hour's notice, he was told to show up at the Kremlin at 3 p.m. At 4.30, he figured he'd been there probably as long as he would be allowed to stay, so he got up to leave, and Khrushchev said, no, no, stay, stay. He ended up having dinner there. Khrushchev brought in Anastas Mikoyan, his top assistant. Uh, and they ended up eating, talking, and Humphrey didn't leave till 11 o'clock that night. Well, I found in Humphrey's archive in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, a diary in which Humphrey had jotted down in his own hand his impressions of this evening at the Kremlin. And I'd like to tell you a bit about it. For Humphrey was very pleased, first of all, because he had survived. And he wrote in his diary the following. Uh, now I'm going to give you a bit. Of, my Humphrey imitation is no better than my Nixon imitation, but I'm the only living American that's gone to the men's room three times in one day in the Kremlin. This guy has a great sense of humor, and he's very clever, very clever. Believe me, you're not dealing with a non-entity. This boy was born early and leaves late. Believe you me. What this guy has been reading up on, brackets, the political situation in New York, California, and Minnesota, including the election of a man Khrushchev called the new McCarthy, namely Eugene, rather than Joe. I wish I had, says Humphrey. At one point, he, Humphrey continues, Khrushchev tore off on a whole long lecture like I wish I could remember, because it would have been the best speech I could ever make in my life on anti-racialism. Boy, he really gave me a talk on that. We really got along just fine. I liked him like nobody's business. And one other episode from this visit. Uh, as they, Khrushchev liked to talk, this was one of his ways of 
uh, emphasizing his seriousness about that Berlin ultimatum and trying to intimidate Westerners into reacting to it in the way that he wanted. So one of the things he liked to do was tell visiting Westerners how many nuclear bombs it would take to destroy various Western cities. So on this occasion, he asked Humphrey what his native city was. And then Khrushchev got up from the table, approached a large wall map of the United States, and drew a circle around Minneapolis with a fat blue pencil. Then he said to Humphrey, that's so I don't forget to order them to spare the city when the rockets fly. <laughs> Humphrey apologized that he wouldn't be able to reciprocate and spare Moscow. Actually, he wasn't in a position to spare anything since he wasn't yet in office, but we'll let that pass. Um, when Humphrey got back to Washington, he was debriefed by uh, the State Department, and he told them all about it. Uh, and when, uh, when he was finished being debriefed, he told them uh, that they should study, the administration should study Khrushchev's personality carefully, and they should expose the impressions that people have had of him, of Khrushchev, not only to diplomats and to intelligence officers, but to a psychiatrist. Which brings me to my next episode, which has to do with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, I found as I look back over the Cuban Missile Crisis and the histories of it and the arguments about it, that over the years, people had given various explanations, trying to figure out why in hell Khrushchev had sent those missiles to Cuba in 1962 with the risk entailed of being discovered and producing the kind of crisis which it did produce. Which, by the way, when you look closely at the history, I think brought us closer to a nuclear confrontation than we imagined. And uh, the reason I think we were closer than we imagined was we knew that there were these medium range missiles and intermediate range missiles on Cuba capable of reaching Miami, Washington, Dallas, cities in the United States. We didn't know whether the warheads were there. It turns out they were. But furthermore, he had ordered that quite a few tactical nuclear rockets be delivered to Cuba. These are short range battlefield nuclear weapons. And these uh, weapons, we didn't even know were there at all in some cases. Furthermore, these are weapons which he did not have physical control over in Moscow. That is, even though he gave the order once the crisis began that these weapons were not to be used by the Soviet generals who were in charge of them, he had no ability to keep them from using them. And they had the ability, had they panicked in the course of an American invasion, to use them to blow up marine landing craft or American ships bringing Marines to land on the shores of Cuba. If that had happened, if nuclear weapons had been used in anger for the first time since 1945 by the Soviets, what would have happened next? In Turkey, in Cuba, in Turkey where there were American missiles, in Germany, we don't know. You can't, we can't predict, we can't know in retrospect. But that's what makes me think this was a, such a terrible, uh, dangerous crisis. So I asked myself the question, why did he do it? And most of the answers that you find in the historical literature take the form of speculations about his thinking, about his political calculations. Number one, he did it to protect Cuba from an American invasion following up on the abortive Bay of Pigs invasion by Cuban emigres in April 1961, which the United States had sponsored but also restrained and which had failed. Number two, he did it because by 1962 when he sent the missiles to Cuba, the missile gap in Soviet favor of which the United States had lived in fear in the late 50s had turned out to be in American favor. We had thought there was a gap in their favor because Khrushchev had made us or tried to make us believe that he had more missiles than he actually had. He had bluffed, he had blustered, he had talked about having a missile that could hit a fly in the sky, when in fact he had no such thing, or rather he had maybe four of them. He had a handful of them and they would take days to be loaded with liquid fuel and by the time they were loaded with liquid fuel they probably would have blown up on the launching pad. 
And if they'd ever been launched, they would only have reached their um, targets if they had been guided from guidance posts every 500 miles along the way. And of course, where the posts would have been in the Atlantic Ocean, I'm not sure, every 500 miles. But at any rate, by 1962, it turned out that the United States had a vast advantage in long-range missiles capable of reaching the Soviet Union. And the Soviets had very few. So what better idea, it is said, than to put medium-range missiles, of which they had a great deal, they built them to destroy Europe, in Cuba, 90 miles from our shore. So that's number two. Number three, he put the missiles in Cuba as a prelude for resuming his quest to get whatever it was he wanted on Germany and Berlin. Uh, this, by the way, was the interpretation that President Kennedy and the people around him leapt to after they were told the missiles were there. Because Khrushchev had been pushing, pushing for four years, and in the very winter, fall, winter, spring of 61, 62, he had been conducting a secret so-called pen pal correspondence with Kennedy in which Khrushchev came back again and again to Berlin. And in one of these letters, which has been declassified in recent years, he says something to the effect of, uh, there is a precipice, speaking of Berlin, he says, there is a precipice behind me and I cannot retreat a single step. So a third explanation is that Kennedy was right, that this was in a sense about Berlin. Now most of the historians over the years eliminated this as a reason because they said nobody could be crazy enough to send these missiles 10,000 miles across the ocean to Cuba uh, in order to solve something in the middle of Europe. But interestingly enough, in very recent years, as documents have become declassified, this theory looks better and better. One was that quote from the pen pal correspondence. It also turns out that when Pierre Salinger, Kennedy's press secretary, went to visit Khrushchev in May 1962 in Moscow, Khrushchev whisked him off to his country, Dacha, and talked to him for two days about Berlin. Khrushchev mentioned Berlin over and over again. So it looks as if maybe Berlin was on his mind. Anyway, when I did this same reading that I'm telling you about, it began to seem to me this was true, crazy as it sounds. So I went to talk to Khrushchev's foreign policy assistant from that very period, and I said, what about it? His name was Oleg Trojanovsky, who, by the way, had attended Sidwell Friends School in Washington and then Swarthmore and learned his English perfectly that way and had been Khrushchev's interpreter as well as assistant. Anyway, Tryanovsky said, no, 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 Bill, no. The Berlin crisis was over after the Berlin Wall went up. Cuba had nothing to do with Berlin. So I said, Oleg Alexandrovich, I've just been doing all this reading and Khrushchev has been pounding away at Berlin every month in the months leading up to his decision to send missiles to Cuba. How do you explain this? He said, there was a Cold War on. He had to pound away at something. <laughs> and I'm inclined to believe this may be the case. Anyway, so that's protect Cuba, rectify the nuclear imbalance, perhaps prepare the way for new moves on Berlin, show the Chinese that he was going to be tough with the Americans. Um, there are a whole series of reasons my own guess, my own judgment, is probably all of them entered into the mind of a man who liked to, de to destroy, kill six or seven birds with one stone. But when I said the word crazy, uh, I actually had in mind a technical term, which is not crazy. But it is a psychological term, and I found it used with reference to Khrushchev by a team of CIA psychiatrists who were asked by Kennedy in the spring of 1961 to prepare a personality assessment of Khrushchev for him to be guided by when he met Khrushchev uh, in Vienna. And what that group decided was that Khrushchev was hypomanic. How did they decide? They looked at films, they read interviews, or they talked to people who had gotten to, to see him, they read transcripts of his conversations, and they decided he was hypomanic. Hypomanic turns out to be a subclinical case of manic depression, of bipolarity. Not enough to paralyze, but enough to affect. I went looking for uh, definitions, uh, descriptions of what it means. 
And in one particular book by a psychoanalyst, I found a description which is Khrushchev personified. Elated, energetic, self-promoting, witty and grandiose, overtly cheerful, highly social, given to idealization of others, work addicted, flirtatious and articulate while covertly guilty about aggression toward others, incapable of being alone, corruptible and listen to this when you think about Berlin and Cuba, lacking a systematic approach in cognitive style, grand schemes, racing thoughts, extended freedom from ordinary physical requirements such as food and sleep, constantly up until exhaustion eventually sets in. Well, I would not ask you to trust the CIA, especially these days, but I would not ask you to trust this judgment of Khrushchev except that it was in effect confirmed by the widow of Ambassador Llewellyn Thompson, the ambassador to Soviet Union during the mid-50s, and the man who got to know Khrushchev better than any other Western ambassador. And Mrs. Thompson told me when I interviewed her that as she and her husband and the Khrushchevs flew to Washington in September 1959, uh, Mrs. Khrushchev, talking to Mrs. Thompson, turned and pointed at her husband, Nikita, and said, he's either all the way up or all the way down, which I think amounts to the same thing. So what I'm telling you is that I think that whatever the political calculations that went into the Cuban missile decision, what also went into it was probably a kind of manic mood on Khrushchev's part, a mood of a man who had these mood swings and who at that time thought that he could do something impossible and get away with it, and who decided to do it, who didn't ask the opinion of his ambassador to Washington, didn't ask the opinion of his foreign policy assistant who had gone to Swarthmore, not that Swarthmore would have taught him, but that uh, who had spent an awful lot of time in the United States, didn't ask the opinion of his advisors, but just went ahead and decided to do it, and then, of course, they all saluted because this was still a dictatorial system. I'm going to turn finally now to the secret speech and uh, why Khrushchev did that. But before I do that, I realized there was one other incident that I wanted to tell you about which involved the Berlin crisis and which may again risk violating the rules of the house, but nonetheless, it's sort of priceless and it gives you a sense of, of Khrushchev uh, at his most vulgar and shall we say direct. Avril Harriman went to visit him during the Berlin crisis, a little bit later than Humphrey. And during this uh, evening, another long evening, Harriman was informed by Nikita that one bomb could take care of Bonn and the Ruhr, and Paris would require two or three, and London would require maybe four or five, and London is all of England. And you can have surrounded, you have surrounded us with bases, but our rockets can destroy them. If you start a war, we may die, but the rockets will fly automatically. Well, as, as direct as this is, what followed was even more. You may tell anyone you want, Khrushchev continued, that we will never accept Adenauer as a representative of Germany. He is a zero. If Adenauer pulls down his pants and you look at him from behind, you can tell Germany is divided. <laughs> if you look at him from the front, you can see that Germany will not stand. <laughs> For those of you who wonder what uh, the vast apparatus of the United States um, classification system actually classifies when they classify secret documents, I want to tell you that when I got this document first uh, in its declassified form via the Freedom of Information Act, those last couple of lines were blacked out. <laughs> this was, of course, about 30 years after this happened, and you may wonder why this should be top secret. After all, it wasn't Harriman who said it, it was Khrushchev. I suppose the answer is that we don't want other leaders who might vouch safe to us in secret uh, remarks like this about other world leaders. We don't want them to think that someday what they have to say will be declassified by the United States government and whoever reads about it will learn just how vulgar they had been in their time. Anyway, finally, the secret speech itself. 
a secret speech that began this process of undermining communism, I think, by dethroning Stalin, who had been a god for so many Russians and who, in his godlike status, had legitimized communism in the eyes of so many, not only in the Soviet Union, but abroad. Here, too, if you ask why did Khrushchev do it, you are, first of all, usually referred to calculations, what he wanted to accomplish. And uh, if you're talking to somebody who thinks that Khrushchev was trying to accomplish his greatest goals to create a kind of communism which would be, which would lift people's lives, then the answer is he was trying to cleanse communism of the Stalinist stain and to rehabilitate it by condemning the man who had perverted it. If you think, as many people do, that Khrushchev was actually more interested in accumulating power than achieving his great goals, then you might say that he did it to distance himself from Stalin's crimes uh, and to blacken the reputation of the rivals he was competing with for Stalin's succession who had been closer to Stalin than he was. There are other calculations that you may cite, but what I want to tell you this evening is that I have come to the conclusion that in addition to these, there was a deep sense of guilt and shame and anger. And I want to give you examples of the evidence that led me to this conclusion, which I must say is a conclusion that not everybody shares. And especially I found a lot of Soviets and Russians I talk to don't share it because they found it hard to believe that somebody with as much blood on his conscience as Khrushchev had could have no conscience left after all. But I had the opportunity to travel to Donetsk in eastern Ukraine. You've been reading about it recently. It's the place where Yanukovych, the defeated Ukrainian presidential candidate, come from, came from, defeated, as you know, by Yushchenko in the most recent Canadian elections. Anyway, when Khrushchev was um, the leader of Ukraine, beginning in 1938, he took a trip to Donetsk to visit an old childhood friend of his, a friend who lived there and who had at once point joined the Communist Party, but then left it. Well, I've met the daughter of this man, and she told me about the time on Khrushchev's second visit to her father's house, when with nobody else present, the father, her father, and Khrushchev had the following conversation. Khrushchev urged his old friend to come to Kiev, where Khrushchev was the party boss, done a good job and make sure that his children were educated. And his old friend said, for me, but no one got you and me educated. The kids will do it themselves. As for me, I'm not leaving my house, and I won't join the party the way it is now. To join that party is to join shit. You've destroyed the real party, the one you joined back then, the one that included, and then he gave the names of some of Stalin's victims, high officials like Yakir, Tukhashevsky, and Kirov. At this point, Khrushchev, according to this account, answered, don't blame me for all that. I'm not involved in that. When I can, I'll get even with that Mudak Shvili in full. Stalin's real name, Georgian, name was Jugashvili. Mudak is one of the many, many Russian words for prick. So what he was saying was, when I can, I'll settle with that prick in full. I don't forgive him any of them, not Kirov, not Yakir, not Tukhashevsky, not the simplest worker or peasant. Well, again, I had to ask myself when I heard this and I contemplated its significance, whether she was telling me the truth, whether she remembered it correctly, how could he have said this? How could a man who was carrying out orders uh, which led to deaths of people just like that, how could he secretly have thought that? And I only believe it because I came across a couple of instances, which I describe in the book, which seem to confirm it at the time, 16 years before the secret speech itself. And then, because I encountered evidence which comes from the period after Khrushchev was ousted in power, from power, and which seems to confirm it later on. And here, I want to read again two or three short passages. <clears throat> After Khrushchev was ousted from power, as you know, he wrote his, or he dictated his memoirs. They were published in Time magazine in 1969-70, and then by Little Brown in the West. 
The Soviets didn't like that at all. They'd been smuggled out secretly, although in one of the complexities of which Soviet life is rife, Soviet politics is rife, it turns out that the, one of the high Soviet officials who connived to facilitate the smuggling out was none other than Yuri Andropov, the head of the KGB. So with one hand, Yuri Andropov, the head of the KGB, is conniving to allow them to be smuggled out. And on the other hand, the KGB is chasing after everybody who had any contact with Khrushchev to find out how they're being smuggled out. At any rate, Khrushchev is called in by the Party Control Commission. He's raked over the coals. And in this conversation, he says, he says about the time uh, of Stalin, so many were put to death. So many of my friends were executed, all dedicated beyond doubt to the party. Arrest me, please, he says. Shoot me. I'm sick of living. I don't want to live. I want to die. I want to die an honest man. I'm 70 years old, I'm in my right mind, and I answer for all my words and deeds. I'm prepared for any punishment up to and including the death penalty. Throughout my whole political career, I was never the one interrogated. And then from a conversation that he had also in retirement with a Soviet playwright, Mikhail Shatrov. Shatrov asked him what of all the things in his life Khrushchev most regretted. And Khrushchev's answer was, most of all, the blood. My arms are up to the elbows in blood. That is the most terrible thing that lies in my soul. And finally, another remark from the end of his life. Khrushchev said, after I die, they will place my actions on a scale. On the one side, evil. On the other side, good. I hope the good will outweigh the bad. Well, I've asked myself many times, as I worked on the book and as I finished it, and ever since, too, what I think. Does the good outweigh the evil? I don't really know. I think if you pushed me, I would have to say no, because the evil was so awful. But I think the main thing about this man is that there was both good and evil in his life. You may have seen pictures of that headstone that Vesny designed at Khrushchev's grave. It's white and black intersecting stone with a bust of Khrushchev uh, on it. Intersecting white and black stone exemplifying the good and bad in his life. I find myself on the one hand feeling admiration and um, respect and even a kind of affection for the man who did the good that he did, but also feeling a kind of horror and disdain for a man who had Known, known, once known better, but then wasn't able to live up to his own code. That's the way I feel about him, but I think one thing you have to say, whatever else you think about him, is that this was a man in whose life there was never a dull moment. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would be glad to um, try to answer questions or respond to any comments you might make. Yes. Really? Oh, my goodness. Foy Kohler is? No, it's Oh, yes, Oh, wonderful. Yes. Yes. 
Did, did everybody hear his hear the question? Yes. Well, I, it, I I'm, I'm moved by your story. I, I know Khrushchev was very upset, uh, both personally and because by that time, he had decided that Kennedy could be a partner for what he wanted to accomplish in the world. He had previously had a very low opinion of Kennedy after the Vienna summit, but then he came to greatly respect him and to count on doing business with him, only to have him assassinated. As for Mrs. Khrushchev, she, the fact that she behaved the way you did is really remarkable because as I came to understand her, I never met her, she was uh, in her own way an iron lady. Very, very strong, very, very tough, very, very strict with her children, strict as she could be with her husband. I didn't, so to, to this, this, I think this background suggests she was even more moved, if possible, than your description of the situation suggests. On the question of Khrushchev and the United States, well, he did have advisors. He had a, he had a foreign minister beginning in 1957, Gromyko. Of course, at that point, Gromyko was very young and uh, deferential. Um, as Khrushchev once said, if I tell him to pull down his pants and sit on a block of ice, he will. Um, so Gromyko was not likely to uh, offer advice unsolicited, and Khrushchev was not the type who solicited advice. Uh, he got some, you know, anyway, through channels uh, from the ministries and from the Central Committee departments. But one, another fact is he had a very small personal staff, as I've come to understand it. You know, you think of the White House, the president, the huge White House staff. He had a very tiny personal staff. If you take those people apart from the staff members of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Agriculture and all the rest. Um, another problem was that in 62, if one's focusing on that, the ambassador to the United States was Anatoly Dobrynin, who was wonderful, who knew an awful lot, but he just had arrived in Washington. So he was very young and inexperienced, as a, and so he too, well, he wasn't asked for advice either, so he, wasn't, he didn't volunteer it. Troyanovsky, Khrushchev's foreign policy assistant, knew an awful lot about the United States, and he was on his personal staff. But he, too, uh, was very careful, and he, only very late in the game, barely could bring, dared to bring himself to say to Khrushchev uh, very tentatively, are you sure about those missiles in Cuba? This was, you know, many uh, days after the decision had been made. And Khrushchev said, well, it's too late. I've made the decision. We'll see what happens. So it's partly a matter of a dictatorial system in which if the dictator doesn't ask, people don't say. And it's also the fact that this dictator um, was full of himself and thought he knew everything. Somebody like Brezhnev, who came after him, would ask for more advice. As I understand it, when Brezhnev conducted a Politburo meeting, he invited opinion and spoke later. Khrushchev always said first what he was going to do so everybody knew to knew in advance what to approve of. Yes. Uh, I too enjoyed your lecture enormously. Thank you. Uh, it is my recollection from reading Frederick Smith's The New Russians that he believed that the secret speech, what Khrushchev was apologizing was the purges by Stalin of the Russian leadership, not of what happened in the Gulag. And it is my recollection that Smith said that it was Gorbachev who released most of the prisoners and rehabilitated those who were in the Gulag. Is that at variance with your thesis? Did you all hear that question? Um, first of all, Khrushchev's secret speech has a line through it in 1934. Essentially what Khrushchev is saying is that up until about 1934, Stalin did good things. After 1934, he began to do terrible things. Uh, what that means is that all the people who were arrested and liquidated before 1934 or sent to the Gulag 
that was okay. And that included the kulaks and the rich, better to do peasants and the social democrats and the, you know, all the rest. It was in particular Stalin's violence against the Communist Party, both at high levels and medium levels, that was um, what Khrushchev was most exercised about. So it is quite true that in that speech, uh, Khrushchev uh, tried to save the regime from what would have followed from an outright and total rejection of Stalin and all his works. And it was only Gorbachev who finally was willing to, to do that. Um, although not in the beginning, not the first couple of years. I think if you, if you ask the question about the gulag, I, my, my understanding is that although there were some left in prison, some political prisoners left uh, as late as the 1980s, that the bulk of the political prisoners arrested uh, in the 30s and 40s and 50s had been released in Khrushchev's time. Well, and Khrushchev also arrested people. Uh, he arrested in the thousands, not the hundreds of thousands or millions. But that is one of the one of the blights on his record. That having given this speech, he he um, triggered he uh, a kind of explosion, at least in places like Moscow, of discussion of Stalin, in which people tried to go farther than he had gone in his speech. Tried to demand that unlike Khrushchev's speech, a full-scale reassessment be mounted of the Stalinist system, not just blaming Stalin for certain years of his misbehavior. And when those people wouldn't shut up, they were arrested by Khrushchev, in effect. Yes, back there. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. We have learned in, in recent years uh, that there was, in effect, a secret deal. Uh, and the secret deal was that Khrushchev took the missiles out of Cuba not only in return for the public promise that we would not invade Cuba, which actually, when you look closer, Kennedy f hedge fudged that too, but that was theoretically the deal that the world knew about. But the secret deal that Kennedy would um, also remove missiles from Cuba. Kennedy refused to, from Turkey, sorry. Kennedy refused to make that public for fear that this would complicate relations with Turkey and within NATO. And Khrushchev had no choice but to swallow it. Um, that was, from his point of view, too bad because if he'd been able to say, look what I got in return for taking the missiles out of Cuba. I got a promise not to invade Cuba, and I got rid of the missiles in Turkey. It might have made his success more significant or look more significant, although I think that uh, people like the Chinese were bound to say what they said anyway, which was that this was a disaster. What they called his policy was adventurism followed by capitulationism. Putting the missiles in is adventurism, taking them out uh, as he did with capitulationism. And I think uh, I got to know people who had been around him at that time, and they say that although he took credit for a great victory, for keeping the peace together with Kennedy, that he was deeply chagrined, that he knew that he had failed, and the people around him knew too, and they held it against him when they threw him out of office two years later. Yes. Well, both Khrushchev and Kennedy handled it well, judging by the fact that it ended peacefully. If, of course, there had been a mistake here or there and it had not ended peacefully, we'd probably look back and say, and if the world had gone to hell in a handbasket, we'd say, was it really worth that to get those missiles out of Cuba? Um, and we'd, have, we'd be even more critical of Khrushchev for triggering the crisis. But even there, you have to say that if Khrushchev triggered the crisis by sending the missiles to Cuba, Kennedy tempted him to do so by seeming to prepare for another invasion of Cuba. Uh, I was present at conferences at which people like McNamara and um, Schlesinger and the others who worked with Kennedy at the time, McNamara in particular, said, yes, we had exercises, military exercises. They had an exercise in the spring of 1962 called Ortsak, uh, 
which is Castro spelled backwards, um, in which they pretended to invade Cuba. They landed in Puerto Rico or something like that. And uh, McNamara said, yes, we were doing this, all, but of course we were never going to invade Cuba. Well, the Cubans and the Soviets thought they might. And looking at exercises like that and the efforts to poison Castro and all the rest, you, might, you would understand why they expected it. So, in a sense, Kennedy behaved in a way that tempted Khrushchev irrationally to set those, send those missiles to Cuba. Khrushchev did send them to Cuba irrationally. Then Kennedy demanded their return. That looks very good because they were returned. And the two men, I guess, backed off and were very careful at the last minute. The, the final point about Kennedy is that there were people around him who wanted blood. There were people in the military like, Colonel, like General LeMay who actually talked back to Kennedy. We hear that on the tapes made during the crisis, accusing him, in effect, of another Munich for appeasing Khrushchev. So Kennedy uh, didn't do what he was urged to do that would have really set the fat into the fire. And in fact, there was even, Kennedy had even set it up so he had passed the word to um, UN Secretary General Oufant through Andrew Cordier, the then president of Columbia, or the dean of School of International Affairs, I forget which, Columbia, to have a proposal made by the United Nations which would have solved the crisis, the same one that Khrushchev and he, in effect, agreed upon if it hadn't been agreed upon before then. So Kennedy, to his credit, was bound and determined not to go to war and to find a way out, and for that he has to be praised. Yes. Yes, I, that, that's, the, that's the general view that Kennedy learned not to trust the military. Yes, sir. Would you comment on the access to archives of the Kremlin, during this, covering this, the Stalin period? Is it, to what extent is it accessible? And to what extent are you handicapping the, the connection of your own history? The question has to do with access to the Soviet archives about the Stalin period in particular. When I began working on this book in the 1980s, there was no access, mid-80s, nothing, period. Um, Glasnost began to create, set the stage, but the real opening occurred when the Soviet Union collapsed in the first few years afterwards. Uh, it took them a few years to get sorted out, and since then, especially under Putin, they begun reclassifying some things that they declassified and closing things that they opened. Uh, in the first years, they had delightfully, they came to the delightful conclusion that this was the Soviet Union and that was gone and therefore there was no reason to keep it secrets. And that was now a new Russia, post-Soviet Russia. But in recent years, they've, I guess, decided there's a kind of continuity. So they want to protect Soviet secrets. Nonetheless, it was possible then, and it still is possible, to get to see wondrous things in Soviet party archives, government archives, uh, not only in Moscow, but I saw the archives in Kiev and on Donetsk. I saw city archives in Moscow as well as top federal archives. Uh, the two things I did not get to see because our access is much less generously granted if it's granted at all and when it's granted only to people who either are in very, very good favor or had more money to spend than I did, are the so-called presidential archive and the KGB archives. But even that is now opening up and the Khrushchev Fond, as it's called, as well as the Stalin Fond, have been transferred to other archives which are easier to get to and they have published uh, volumes of key documents that I saw only parts of at the time. There is a commission. My, my understanding is it works uh, episodically and erratically. And it probably works, it, it works with one eye over its shoulder on Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. I'm happy to say that Gorbachev has gathered a lot of documents from his period in his foundation, in its archive, and I'm also happy to say, although I'm also a little um, 
Well, I'm happy to say that I've decided to write a biography of Gorbachev as my next project. I hesitate because it's another big project, and I just hope it doesn't take me 20 years the way this one did. <laughs> yes? The question is, what's Khrushchev's role, if any, or my view on it in Stalin's death? Uh, there was a book published recently, edited by a Russian archivist I know, uh, Vladimir, Vladimir Naumov, and the um, editor at Yale University Press, Jonathan Brent, which speculates based on documents that they saw that Stalin might well have been poisoned. Uh, I came across a, a remark of Beria, the police chief, to Molotov after Stalin's death, in which Beria says something to the effect of, well, we got rid of him for you. I don't think there's any proof, and I actually wonder about it, because Stalin was paranoid enough to ch have checked things, you know, things checked 16 times. One wonders whether that could have been done. But whether or not that was done, one thing is very clear. Uh, and that is that when Stalin fell sick, either as a result of poison or more likely a stroke, uh, he collapsed on the floor of his dacha outside of Moscow, and his guards were too terrified to go in and wake him up because they were strictly trained never to go in unless he called, and he didn't call. But when they finally went in and found him on the floor in a scene I describe in my book, they summoned Beria and Malenkov, and Beria and Malenkov arrived and took a look at Stalin lying on the floor, soaked in his own urine, you know, gasping for breath. And they said, the man's just drunk, leave him alone. He'll wake up in due time. So it was seven or eight hours after that that the medical people finally arrived. Um, at that point, they contributed to his death by not summoning the medical people. Now you might say that they too were afraid to summon the doctors because Stalin didn't like doctors and they didn't want to second guess him, but I think at that point they knew. And so by not summoning the doctors, they were, they were ensuring that a man who was dying for whatever reason was going to finally croak. Yes? Well, Solzhenitsyn, uh, you know, published some of his early works or wrote some of his early works uh, in Khrushchev's time, began writing even before then. Um, in Khrushchev's time, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich was actually published with Khrushchev's permission. Uh, so was a short story, uh, Matryon in Dvor. Uh, Solzhenitsyn was grateful to Khrushchev, half expected to get a Lenin Prize, which I think Khrushchev wanted to give him, but uh, backed off at the last minute. After Khrushchev was ousted, there was a kind of semi-rehabilitation of Stalin and a cracking down on that kind of literature. Therefore, First Circle and Cancer Ward, which uh, Solzhenitsyn wrote, were not published in Russia until Gorbachev's time, but were published abroad, and as a result, Solzhenitsyn was hounded out of the country. Of course, he did write, at one point in the early 70s, a famous letter to the Soviet leaders, advising them on how Russia needed to be changed and what to do, and I don't think they paid much attention to it, although they might have lived, their, their system might have lasted a little longer had they done so. Yes? We, we have pretty de detailed descriptions of the meetings of the Presidium when those letters were prepared, or after or before which they were prepared. We know that Khrushchev dictated the first letter. Um, this is the letter that proposed the deal in which the missiles would be removed from Cuba in return for a pledge not to invade Cuba. Um, 
they guessed right at the time because it was written in a kind of folksy style, which sounded like the kind of thing that Khrushchev would say. Um, we know that the second letter uh, was not written by somebody other than Khrushchev, but that Khrushchev was present at the decision to write it, perhaps was even his idea, but in this case it was left to a committee to draw it up and polish it. Uh, it certainly was not done behind his back. It was not done by hawks, you know, whereas he was the dove. That kind of projection over the years of Western experience, we have hawks, we have doves, doves they must too, was always an error. It was never more than an error when in Stalin's time, occasionally Western observers would decide that Stalin was the good guy and there were these bad guys, you know, who were forcing him to do things that he wouldn't have done on his own. Um, but what actually happened, the reason Khrushchev agreed to do the second letter was that he decided he'd done the first one in a panic that Kennedy was about to act. And then there were a couple of signals which made him think he had more time. Um, and uh, I think one of them was not so much a signal, it was a column by Walter Lippmann in the Herald Tribune suggesting a missiles in Turkey for missiles in Cuba trade, which again, in another one of these misperceptions, the Russians thought was a signal from Kennedy, which it wasn't. But at any rate, they thought they had more time, so that's why they sent the second letter. As you say, the Americans were just rejoicing at the receipt of the first. When they got the second, then they were plunged themselves into kind of despair. What are we going to do now? But meantime, in Moscow, two or three other items of news arrived, which I won't go into, which consist, which convinced Khrushchev that Kennedy was hours away from uh, an invasion of Cuba and was going to make a speech on television that Saturday night, the 28th. And so Khrushchev turned around and caved. My wife is pointing to the watch, which means <laughs> to, <laughs> she's, it's nine o'clock. I, I, I would be glad to take one or two more questions. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 uh, Khrushchev's relationship with Mao is another one that I think hinged on psychology personal psychology of, the, of the both men. And it's another case where personality really mattered because the Sino-Soviet split, shaped as it was by ideology and borders and you know different kinds of communism being built at different paces, was also exacerbated by the fact that these two men hated each other's guts. In Khrushchev's case, the trouble was that he came into power thinking that Stalin hadn't treated Mao properly and that he, Khrushchev, would. And then he bestowed upon Mao the gifts of aid and attention of all kinds, uh, and Mao repaid him with condescension and contempt. Not simply for, for the way Khrushchev had doled out the, the attention and the aid, not so much for that, but more because of what Mao considered the way Khrushchev had mishandled the Stalin issue, made a, must, a mess of, ha of the East European re revolt in Hungary and the Polish situation. And so Mao, um, when Khrushchev went to see him to try to make, thing right, make things right, just uh, treated Khrushchev with, with disdain, contempt, and Khrushchev hated the result um, and reacted by uh, eventually in 1960, pulling thousands of Soviet advisors out of China almost overnight, which was also irrational because those were his best eyes and ears in China. So it's a whole story uh, which I won't retell, but again, uh, it's impersonal forces of various kinds, but it's also the character of these two leaders. I think this is a good time to call this meeting to an end. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.